at this point in the course, the chemistry that we've been talking about, the science that we've been talking about, has been the macroscopic level. So that means that this is the science that we can see with our eyes. For the last third of this course, what we're going to do is focus on the microscopic world. How can we connect all the things that we talked about with the macroscopic world, the properties, how, how things behave, with the with the idea of an atom so let, let's we're gonna we're gonna talk about the atomic and subatomic worlds first and then as we're going through the course the rest of this course eventually we're going to zoom back out to that macroscopic level so that way at the very very end when we start talking about intermolecular forces we we've, we've got our first major connection between how the microscopic world and the macroscopic world behave with each other. So that's the plan of what we're going to do. So to start there, uh, what we're going to do is review a brand new science, well, relatively new. Uh, it's been around for about 100 years at this point, and this science is called quantum mechanics. So this is the science that explains how atoms behave. Okay, so uh, with this course, I'm not going to go right into, we're not going to dive way into quantum mechanics. I'm going to give you kind of like the brief overview. But if you continue on with science, with chemistry, uh, eventually you're going to get to this course called uh, either quantum chemistry or physical chemistry, where you're going to focus, you're going to really zoom in on this. All right, so let me tell you how this all began. So until the turn of the 20th century, Physicists were trying to explain how the atom works using the laws derived from classical physics. So we're talking about Newton's laws of motion. And because everything at this point, up until about 1900, everything at this point followed Newton's laws. So it followed classical physics. Okay. Now, physics, uh, the, the physicists at this time were trying to explain the atom as if it was a bouncy ball. And if you think about like a bouncy ball that you get out of the, out of the like the the prize thing at, at Kroger or any you know, you you, th you throw the ball it bounces higher and then it, you know as long as there was no friction the ball keeps bouncing higher and higher. So physicists were trying to explain the pressure exerted by a gas by treating this molecule as a bouncy ball and when molecules or atoms bounce off of each other you know collide they bounce off of each other that was kinetic molecular theory, okay. So keep in mind that kinetic molecular theory at this point ex was basically the explanation of how atoms behave. But if you guys remember a couple, you know, almost a month ago now, uh, that was, you know, there were holes in this theory. It wasn't a, while it was a good theory for the 1860s, at this point in time, we had just, science had just discovered what the electron is and started thinking about this atom. Okay, so there were holes in this theory. So, for instance, this model, the, the bouncy ball model, the kinetic molecular theory, this model could not explain why molecules are so stable. So in other words, what, what scientists were trying to figure out is, what is the glue that holds atoms together? Now, we know the answer to this question. What is the glue that holds atoms together? Chemical bonds. Okay. But that's near the end of the story. So we know we know the answer right away. It's like you, you're, <clears throat> it's like you're watching a movie. You know where the ending is, but you're watching the story progress, and that's kind of where it is. Kind of what we're going to be doing. So we know what this final answer is. It's chemical bonds that holds atoms together in a molecule and that makes it all stable. The conclusion that science has held at this point was that atoms are not governed by the laws of classical physics. Okay, so that so those were pretty much the two major conclusions. What is the glue that holds atoms together? Chemical bonds. 
And then the conclusion that atoms are not governed by the laws of classical physics, that was a major breakthrough. And it took scientists between the discovery of the electron to uh, the formation of quantum theory, uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, there is about 25 years, give or take, in that, in that period where scientists were trying to figure out with every new piece of information, how do we relate this back to classical physics? So let's talk about how this new science was built or the birth. And it was actually uh, the birth. If, if you want to you know, pinpoint it on one exact location, it actually started with a German, German physicist. His name was Max Planck. And what he was doing was looking at data on radiation emitted by solids to various temperatures. And what he found was that atoms and molecules emit energy in only certain discrete quantities. So it's kind of like, I'm going to draw a really quick picture before I go on, but it's almost like if you heat up a piece of metal, okay, so what I'm going to do is on the x-axis, we're going to have time, and then on the y-axis, we're going to have energy, okay, I'm just going to call it E. So if you heat up a piece of metal, keep heating it up, heating it up to the point where you start to take away that flame. And I'm going to mark that point with an X. We expect this metal to emit that energy to, in order to cool down. And it's going to look kind of like a bell curve. Okay. Now, what Planck saw, though, was this. That at, when you heat up that metal, it starts to release energy, and then it drops down. Once it releases all that energy at a certain level, it drops down to the next level. So it almost looks like a progression of steps. Okay. And so that's what he kept finding. Every time he would heat up a metal, it would get to that point where it would release, you know, it would release all energy in only certain discrete quantities. And he called these discrete quantities, he called these quanta. So these discrete quantities that he was looking at, he called these quanta. Okay, and the singular of this word is quantum. Okay, now the classical physics view was that the energy is continuous and that any amount of energy could be released in the radiation process. So again, what he, we're talking about in step three, we're talking about the other half of the bell curve. You take away that heat, you take away that flame source, the piece of metal is going to eventually be, it's going to release that energy, release that heat, and it's going to be a continuous slope, okay? But that is that atoms and molecules are only releasing a finite amount of energy, the stepwise thing, this was an idea that literally changed the world. Because Planck did this experiment over and over and over again, and he realized that he was missing something. Something's not right here. This is not behaving like we expect it to, like we want it to. So for years, he did this experiment over and over because he thought he was doing it wrong. And it turns out he wasn't. He actually, there was something else at play here. Now, before we go a little bit further and talk about uh, Planck's work, I got to give you, we got to go back to physics and talk a little bit about uh, some ideas that we're going to use from physics. So for instance, a wave, we got to define what a wave is. A wave is a vibrating disturbance by which energy is transmitted. Okay, and so there's a couple things that we can do to measure the measure a wave. So, for instance, we can measure a wave's wavelength. Okay, and we represent wavelength in physics with the Greek symbol lambda. Okay, this is the distance between identical points on successive waves. Okay, and we use the unit that we use to measure that distance, we use meters. So I'm going to write that in lowercase m. All right, so that's the first term, wavelength, and we use the Greek symbol lambda to represent wavelength. We can also measure the vertical distance of a wave from the midline of a wave to the peak or the trough. This is called the amplitude. So the amplitude is the height of the wave from the midpoint to the top. Okay, 
So we've got the wavelength, which is the length of the wave from one point to the other. So the top of the wave to a top of a wave. Okay, we've got the amplitude, which is going to be the vertical distance. And then finally, how many waves that actually pass a particular point in one second, we call that the frequency. So the frequency, which we use the Greek symbol nu to, to show that, it looks like a fancy V. Frequency is going to be the number of waves that pass a particular point in one second. Okay. Now, because there's a time, you know, because we're counting the number of waves per second, the unit is going to be something like one over seconds, or sometimes books will write it this way, seconds to the minus first power. We actually have a unit that uh, th that converts one over seconds to something else, and we call that hertz. Now, sounds are usually measured in hertz. Okay, so we've got frequency, which is how many waves pass a certain point in a given amount of time. We've got the amplitude, which is the, the, the vertical distance of a wave, how high is the wave, and then you got the wavelength, which is the length of a wave from the top to the top <clears throat> of another wave. So with all this, we can actually calculate the speed of a wave using this equation. If we know the wavelength, lambda, which again, this is meters, okay, and we know the frequency, which again is going to be one over seconds, if we multiply these two together, the, for, the overall unit that we're going to get is meters per second, which is speed. So usually in physics, we don't want speed because that means that we don't have a direction. So we measure it in velocity. Okay, so V is going to stand for velocity. Okay, so again, to calculate the speed or velocity of a wave, we take the meet, we take the wavelength with lambda, which has units of meters, multiply it by nu, which is the frequency. Those two together give give you that unit meters per second, and that's the unit that we use to measure velocity. Okay. Now there are many different types of waves, and if you go into the second half of physics, you actually start talking about those waves. So you've got normal, like water waves, you've got sound waves, you've got electri electric waves, you've got magnetic waves. Another type of wave that we've got is electromagnetic waves. And that's what actually we're, we're going to focus in on, on this topic, on, on this chapter. So this idea of an electromagnetic wave... This actually was discovered or thought of by the, uh, the first by this guy named James Clerk Maxwell. And the year that he actually came up with this idea was 1873. And what he thought of, he actually imagined, his theory behind the electromagnetic wave is that you have two waves that are perpendicular to each other. So it's almost like this. You've got one wave is going to be your electric component, your electric field component. The other wave is going to be the magnetic field component. Now, what's really cool is that even though you have these two waves and they're perpendicular to each other, every time they cross an axis, both waves intersect. Okay, so both wave ha waves have their own maxima. They have their own minimum, but the midpoint, <clears throat> Excuse me. The midpoint is when these two waves actually cross. So that's pretty cool. So these waves are completely in sync with each other. Pretty cool. All right. So now the reason why his theory is so important to us 
So the reason why his theory is so important, this provides a mathematical view of the behavior of life, uh, behavior of light. And it also describes how radiation is propagated through space. So that's pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. All right. So um, it also describes how radiation is propagated. Now, this, if we connect radiation to the electromagnetic waves, that radiation is called electromagnetic radiation. which we shorthand as EMR. And EMR is the emission or propagation of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves. Okay. Now, because electromagnetic waves are going to have their own frequency and they're going to have their own wavelength, we can't necessarily, and these waves are traveling in space, there's actually a, there's actually a speed that all waves travel in, in a vacuum, and that speed is called the speed of light, which we represent with a lowercase c. And that speed of light that in a vacuum is 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So that's how fast electromagnetic waves will travel. Okay, so let's use, and the same equation that we use to calculate the speed of a wave. So remember it was the wavelength times, uh, the wavelength times the frequency. That was what we used to calculate the velocity or speed of a wave. In this case, when we're talking about electromagnetic waves, instead of using velocity, that lowercase c, uh, lowercase v, we're going to use lowercase c. So this is how we describe mathematically the speed or the velocity of an electromagnetic wave. So let's try this equation out for a minute. What is the wavelength in meters of an electromagnetic wave whose frequency is 3.64 times 10 to the 7th hertz? Okay, so you got this equation, C is equal to lambda times nu, and you know what nu is, 3.64 times 10 to the 7th hertz. Okay, so in this equation, we're going to be solving for lambda. To get lambda by itself, we have to divide nu by both sides. So lambda would be equal to the speed of light, C, divided by nu, the frequency, or 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by the frequency, which is 3.64 times 10 to the 7th hertz, or 1 over seconds. So the seconds will cancel out, and we should get something like in the realm of 8.24 meters. So that's it. As long as you know one, as long as you know one of these, as long as you know the lambda or you know the frequency, C is a constant, so you can automatically solve for the one that's missing. <clears throat> now we can also categorize the different types of electromagnetic radiation. And the, the what's the, the trend that we see here is that the things that have shorter wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths tend to have higher energies. And longer wavelengths will tend to have lower energies. Okay. And so the picture that we're looking at below this is the types of electromagnetic radiation that's possible.
So on the left hand side, the most, the, the strongest type of electromagnetic radiation is gamma rays. Okay. And then after gamma rays, then it follows X rays. And then ultraviolet rays. And then right in between ultraviolet and infrared, we've got visible light. So strongest would be the gamma rays. The weakest, we're looking at radio waves. And usually the radio waves of AM radio is about as low as we can go. Okay. All right. So that's kind of cool. All right. So let's go back to Planck. Now that we've talked a little bit about physics, let's now go back to Planck. So measurements taken in the last half of the 19th century show that the amount of energy emitted by an object at a certain temperature depends on its wavelength. So there's got to be some sort of relationship between energy and wavelength. Now scientists tried to unite this relationship with the laws of thermodynamics, which were only about 40 years old, okay, and they had very limited success. So the scientists were figured out that there was it was an apparent that something was missing from this equation. Something's not right. And so what Max Planck did was try to figure out how do we relate the temperature, how do we relate the energy of a compound, energy of, of something to its wavelength. And so remember at this at the idea at this time was that objects emit or absorb an arbitrary amount of energy. And that Planck initially said that an object emits or absorbs a finite amount of energy, which we call quanta. Let's define what quantum is. Uh, we said that quantum was a singular of quanta. Quantum, this is the smallest amount of energy that can be emitted or absorbed oops that can be emitted or absorbed in the form of electromagnetic radiation The equation that Max Planck came up with was that he said that the energy that's either being admitted or emitted or absorbed is going to be equal to the frequency nu. Okay. Now there's a relationship between these two and you, there's some sort of constant or some sort of a variable that's in there. And what he did was call that H. So Planck called this H. H is known as Planck's constant. And Planck's constant has a value of 6.64 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. Okay, so if you know the frequency of an electromagnetic magnetic wave and you multiply it by Planck's constant, you'll be able to get the energy of that wave or of that, of that quantum. Okay, now... To relate this back to what we talked about with, with speeds and, and velocities and all that, remember that we said that the speed of light of a wave is equal to 3.0 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. But this is equal to lambda, the wavelength, times nu, the frequency. So what we want to do is rearrange that equation to solve for nu. Okay, so we're going to say that nu, if we divide both sides by lambda, Nu is equal to the speed of light, C, divided by the wavelength. Now, if I take this equation, if I take and pop it in for nu, we get this, that the energy is going to be equal to Planck's constant, H, times the speed of light, divided by the wavelength. Okay, so that's kind of nice. That's kind of nice. We can actually relate the energy of that's being emitted or absorbed to the wavelength. And so that was what Planck brought to the table. 
<coughs> Excuse me. So now this is a really awesome idea in physics because not only did it solve that one question that energy is going to be emitted only in multiples of h times nu, and so that's what Planck was seeing. But the one problem with this is that Planck could not explain why the energy should be fixed or quantized in this manner. And so to answer that question, we have to look to another theory. And that theory is called the photoelectric effect.